Um, good morning, I'm Phil DeMartin Prey. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and uh, if you don't know me yet, um, my privilege to lead us in a study of God's Word this morning it was 2008 when my wife and I, well, she wasn't my wife yet, fiance and I, uh, walked up a stage very similar to this and got married. Now, we said our vows 2008, January, um, just kidding, 5th, 5th, <clears throat> just kidding, just kidding, um, so we've been married eight years, and we got married, we went on our honeymoon, we, were, we managed to go on a three-week honeymoon, we came back, we lived in a, a house in Escondido, and our lives really revolved around ourselves. It was pretty awesome. Um, if we wanted to go out to a movie, we went out to a movie. If we wanted to go out to dinner, we went out to dinner. If we wanted to sleep all hours, of, you know, on a Saturday, it was like, well, I don't work, she doesn't work on a Saturday, so if we want to sleep till noon, we slept till noon. Um, pretty lazy, but you know, you do what you want to do. And then, so 2008, we got married. 2009, we had a child and things stopped being about what we wanted, uh, pretty quickly. You know, I see a lot of nods. You realize that <clears throat> when this little, uh, and I remember the first time I held our, our oldest son, Levi, just the weight of responsibility it was kind of like a, a, I had a real heavy fear because I, I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, I could have read a hundred parent books, but I've never actually parented. It'd be like if you read a hundred how to ride a bicycle books and then just sit on a bicycle and go. It's like, okay, I hope I don't crash with this one. And I, I had this just fear, but this awesome weight of responsibility. And then in the back of my mind was like something was slowly beginning to like die. And that was... I'm not going to be able to do just what I want. Like, my wife and I aren't just going to be able to be like, oh, we're going to go to the movies. Here, Levi, here's a couple extra bottles for you, you know. Good luck. That obviously wasn't going to happen. And so it was interesting because we'd been married a year uh, before my wife got pregnant. And we'd established these patterns, and we really enjoyed, you know, that first year. But we knew we wanted to have kids. And now we have three, and which seems like a lot to some people. I have family members who, my, my older brother and his wife, no kids. Uh, we'll see if they have kids. I have friends that don't have kids that really, they're like, well, maybe when, I'm, maybe when we're 35 or 36, we'll have a kid, and we'll see what happens. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, because as I thought about it, having children, and I, you know, I should probably have the cat keys up here to testify to this, but... Um, <laughs> They're the veterans. They have, you know, this entire row almost as their children. Um, it's kind of an interesting idea, and it seems kind of counterintuitive. My wife and I were in a place where we could do pretty much anything we wanted. Um, if we wanted to plan a vacation, my job was pretty flexible. And then having a kid, that kind of all shut down. It was like we, you know... Our desires would slowly change our, towards our children, and we would integrate them into the things we want to do and do things for them. But it became about self-sacrifice. I mean, you die to yourself, you know, you bring a newborn back to your house, and like I said, you have zero idea what you're doing. We didn't raise infants for a living, so we brought them back, and, you know, they wake up, and it's like, all right, what do we do? Like, he needs to eat, or he needs a diaper change, or whatever. And it begins this pattern of self-sacrifice and dying to yourself. And it's counterintuitive because it's like, why would anybody want to do that? Like, why would you want to do that? You know? And the reason is because you get so much more in return. One of the reasons, not hopefully the primary reason isn't selfish. But we get so much joy from our children. Like watching our sons grow up. So our sons, um, they all have birthdays in October. Um, don't have to worry about January. <clears throat> they all have birthdays in October, so Levi will be seven, Judah will be five, and Jonah will be two. And just watching them grow up and watching the things they do, the way they play together, not all the time, but the way they play together, the way they interact, the way they interact with us, the love they have for us. I mean, parents, we know, like, when you interact with your child, it's like this, this, especially, you know, as they're young and you're developing them, it's just so much joy. It's an incredible challenge. It's incredible work. I mean, you, we hear, you know, you see Nate up here, first time dad, you know, it's pictures of Corbin going up because he loves, I mean, just so much joy in his life and he wants to share it with you and we get to partake in that. But it seems counterintuitive on the surface because you give up 
your life together, my, me and my wife's life together with just the two of us, we just gave that up. And, you know, maybe someday when all our kids are empty nesters, or you know, when we're empty nesters and our kids are all gone, we can figure out what on earth we did when we were married, um, when it was just the two of us. But it just seems like this counterintuitive principle that you give up so much, but then you get so much more in return. You get so much joy, so much fulfillment, so much, I mean, levels of responsibility and, and accomplishment when you see your kids, you know, interacting the way you've trained them to. And what Paul is writing to the Galatians, the principle that he's really going to be driving home, the overarching principle we're going to see this morning, is one of those things. It's very counterintuitive. It would not be something you would write on paper and say, yeah, this sounds like a great idea. And it's that submission, submitting yourself to God's authority, is what sets you free. You see how counterintuitive that is? You see, we live in a culture where it's like personal freedom is king. And if I could work my way out of a job to where I'm just working for myself and I could just do the things I want, that's what I you know, should do. Because then I don't have a boss over me, I don't have anyone controlling me. We're very high on personal liberty. We're very... Very, personal freedoms and our pursuit of happiness, these are fundamental things, and they're not wrong. But what Paul is writing is counterintuitive to our thinking. He says that when, the, more, the more of yourself and your will and your freedom you give up to God's authority, the greater you can recognize God's authority in your life, the more free you will be. The more you come under God's yoke, in a sense, the more you are enslaved to God and recognize his authority over you, the freer you will be. Now, that's, that's very counterintuitive for us. And the Galatians have come under attack that is trying to move them from the freedom they have in submission to God under submission to the law, where Paul has been making the argument that that actually will enslave them to the law, and they will never be free. They will never be free if they come under that. Paul knows that submission to God's authority will set them free. And so what we're going to see this morning is Paul sets out to prove this idea of authority. He's going to prove that his authority as an apostle came directly from God. It is a divinely given authority. And as such, it's going to have certain repercussions, certain implications for the Galatians, so that Paul's authority is from God, and that the gospel that he preached to them, the authority of that gospel is also from God, and that submitting to both Paul and to the gospel is going to set them free. So turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. If you need a Bible or you need a set of notes, uh, raise your hand. We have uh, ushers ready to get you a Bible. And also, I mean, if for some reason you don't have a Bible or you don't have, you know, a Bible that you carry around or, or you have, just please feel free. Um, you can raise your hand if anybody needs the notes. But just take, take a Bible. We have, we have some hardback Bibles we can get in your hands. Just take it home with you. And uh, please feel free if you don't have one. So turn uh, Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> Now, we'll remember that these false teachers that we call the agitators had come into the church and they have a twofold attack on Paul or on the church. One is on on the man, the other is on the message. This two pronged attack. They're going to attack Paul, they're going to attack his apostleship, they're going to attack his motivation, they're going to attack his character, and then they're going to attack the gospel he preached. They're going to attack its authority, they're going to attack its origin. And they're going to attack its authenticity, that it's not real. So this is the two-fold attack that these teachers have brought into the church. These false teachers trying to bring the Galatians back under the law, back under this yoke of slavery from which they'll never be freed. <clears throat> so the first thing we'll see is they make an, they make a, an attack on Paul's character and his motivation for initially sharing the gospel with these Galatians. Paul, we know, as we read his letters, as you read Paul moving through the cities of Acts, there are a couple things that become true about Paul. 
And he even states them. He says, I became all things to all men to win some for Christ. Paul would move into, he would move into a region, he would move into an area, he would try and figure out what was going on in the culture, and then he would try and find ways to bridge the gospel into that culture that was relevant and connected with the people. And so he changed the way he interacted with people. He changed the way, the things he spoke about. But the thing that never changed was the gospel. He never changed. He never altered the gospel message. But he was willing to alter, I mean, his appearance, his interaction, the way he talked, what name he used. I mean, he had Saul and then Paul was his uh, Greek name and, and Saul was his Jewish name. And so he was willing to become all things to all men. He was willing to interact with these different cultures and change. But he never changed the gospel message. One of the accusations here, and so we can see how his desire to be all things to all men could get twisted by these agitators, by these accusers, to where they're now in the church in Galatia, and they're saying to them, Paul, all he wants to do is please people. That's all Paul's motivation. He came in here and preached to you a gospel that just says it's just by faith. I mean, that's so easy, right? That's too easy. Paul's gone in all these different places, and this is how he talks here. Paul's just, a, he just wants to please men. He doesn't care about what's real or what's true. He's just trying to basically make a bunch of friends and maybe get some financial uh, resources out of this. But he doesn't care about the truth. Paul's a man pleaser. And so in verse 10, Paul just puts this whole idea to sleep. There's just no way. So look with me in Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. Just puts these accusations to rest. <clears throat> says a rhetorical question, two of them. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man... I would not be a servant of Christ. If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For Paul, those are incompatible ideas. He recognizes that when he was a Pharisee and when he was under the law, a lot of that was about pleasing man, was becoming worthy by the people that had trained him. And so now he puts that in direct contrast. As a servant of Christ, these are incompatible things. And I think... And I should have tied this in last week, this verse 10, because it really fits with the section above. But the first nine verses of this letter to the Galatians is the greatest illustration of this truth that Paul wasn't seeking to please men. This is not uh, the, the outline for how to win friends and influence people at the beginning of your letter. For example, I'm astonished you're so quickly deserting Jesus. I'm astonished that you're doing this. I cannot believe you guys are being led astray. You do not start a letter like this if you want to make friends, right? It'd be like me sitting down, you know, writing a letter to Matt Smith saying, Hey, Matt, you know, this is Phil, and uh, I seriously, you're ruining your life. You know, and Matt would be like, excuse me? Like, yeah, you're ruining your life. I'm watching the decisions you make. Uh, you're, you're tanking the youth ministry. You are, you know, you're, you're lazy. You're deceived. You're this. It's like, that's not how you make a friend. That's not a friendship letter, right? That's the way Paul starts. I can't believe you guys have left the gospel. This is not a man. And so he, he wraps up that section and says, hey, read above. You think I'm trying to please men? Just go ahead and read these first verses again. I have no interest in pleasing man except to get the gospel into their lives. I will never compromise the gospel. I'm a servant of Christ. I'm not, my goal is not to, to make a bunch of friends and please a bunch of people and get a bunch of resources and money out of this. <clears throat> so he clears his motivation. He clears his character. And now Paul's going to move into kind of an autobiographical section where he's going to talk about his story that is going to remove all doubt about the authority of the gospel and his authority. He's going to share kind of a bit of his testimony. And we'll remember, the attack is a two-pronged one. It's aimed at him and his authority. It's aimed at the gospel and the gospel's authority. And so Paul's going to use his personal story to prove two specific things. That his authority is straight from God and that the gospel's authority is straight from God. 
Now he's going to start from before, his story is going to go from before he was converted, before his, uh, his, the revelation of Jesus on the road to Damascus, and it's going to move all the way to where he currently is in the city of Antioch with Peter and Barnabas. That's going to be the length of the story. <clears throat> now, I know there are some of you who are very good at math, and you think to yourself, all right, we're in week three of this sermon series. We've made it through nine verses. That's four and a half verses a week. There's 149 verses in Galatians. That's like 33 weeks, counting holidays. You know, that's, that's 10 months, you know, in Galatians. Um, so I'm going to put, you know, just put your calculators away. Uh, This morning, we are going to kind of fly through some material um, because this is really one section. This is Paul's testimony that he's using to share. So we're actually going to cover the whole testimony, which will take us through about halfway through chapter 2. So don't worry, you know, you'll be able to celebrate next Christmas, you know, not in Galatians. I think. Um, We'll see. But so turn in your scriptures, and and I went back and forth, but I think it's important for us to read through this. So I'm going to read through this section with you. So please follow with me in your scriptures so you can get an idea. Paul is telling his story, and then we're going to trace some themes through it. So chapter 1, verse 11. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles... I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. And I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles. In order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of God might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, 
If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So here we read this story, and this is Paul's testimony. It's really going to highlight. There's two things that run through this. It has to do with the authority, his authority and the authority of the gospel. The first thing we see is that Paul's authority came directly from God. Not from man, but from God. And he actually starts this letter like this, right? He says, Paul, an apostle, not from man, not through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. He's already primed the pump, and now he's going to complete kind of revealing to them how he received his apostleship. So look with me in 11 and 12. Or I'm sorry, uh, in uh, verse um, 121 through uh, and 2. Sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. <clears throat> so Paul's authority came from God alone. The gospel's authority came from God alone. The first thing he starts with is the gospel. So chapter 1, verse 11. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. Verse 12. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. The gospel was revealed, was taught to Paul by Jesus Christ. By God the Father, through Jesus Christ, in a direct revelation. It was not taught to him by man. It was, he was not discipled in the gospel. It, that's not how he received it. He didn't receive it from the other apostles. He received it directly from Christ. The illustration that he uses in his own life, that the gospel actually, the authority of the gospel came from God, is his own conversion experience. Paul was so convinced in the depths of his soul that the Christian gospel was wrong. He was so thoroughly convinced that he had made it his life's work to put a stop to it by whatever means necessary. So look with me in verse 13 and 14. You have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of, traditions of my father. Paul was so zealous for the law. And he saw that coming under the law, that's how you were made right with God. That's how you found uh, peace with God, was following the rules of the law, following the Mosaic law, being circumcised, following the food laws. And then this group of Christians came up and said, no, it's by faith. Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And Paul said, that is a lie. And Paul was so zealous that he made it his life's mission to stamp that out. So he would break into people's homes. He was trying to find and arrest Christian leaders. He was there when they were killed. He gave approval to the murder of Christians this is, this is what was so deep in this man's soul. What possibly could any man tell him that would change his mind? You think a Christian, you think Peter could come to that Paul and say, hey, no, no, you've, you've misunderstood. This is the gospel. No. That would never happen. The authority of the gospel came directly from God because it's in its power as well. And that changed Paul's life. No, no human convincing could ever change Paul's mind. He was so passionate about putting a stop to this that it was only when God came to him and revealed the gospel to him directly from Christ. He's like, okay, okay, I get it. And his life, just a radical turnaround. A radical turnaround. So, he didn't receive it from man. The gospel had this incredible divine authority and power in his life that transformed his life. The second point he makes that the gospel's authority came from God is that he didn't, he didn't ask anyone. He didn't go to anyone for them to teach him. That's in verses 15 through 17. He says, when, the, when he who had set me apart before I was born, who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. It's kind of a desert region. So when Paul received this, he didn't go 
to check and make sure that this revelation, he didn't go to the apostles, he didn't say, hey, is this right? Like someone told me this. He went away into Damascus, into Arabia, into the desert. And I'm, I'm pretty convinced there's reason to believe because of how Paul, Paul talks about his gospel. It was taught to him by Christ that in this time, and he'll be in the desert here for about three years, that Christ appeared to him. The risen Messiah once again came to Paul. Now, I'm convinced of, convinced of this. We don't have specific evidence from Scripture. But as he talks about the gospel and his understanding of it, that while he was in this desert period preparing for ministry, and we, we see, you know, this is a picture, right? Jesus went out into the desert to prepare for his ministry. We see all the way back to Moses, you know, when he was in the desert you know, getting prepared for his ministry. Here we have Paul out in the desert being prepared for his ministry. And I believe Christ, I, I believe that Christ came and met with him and taught with him. The physical risen Christ taught him the gospel, taught him the scriptures. Because when he comes on the scene, he's not trying to work things out. He is 100% confident in his message. And he doesn't have questions about it. He's not trying to work out some of the details. He knows. He's had all these questions answered and he says his confidence comes from having revealed it specifically from Christ. Another picture we see that adds weight to this argument that the gospel has divine authority, that the gospel is, that he was preaching was specifically from God and carries its authority is in chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. We're not going to read all that. But basically, Paul does eventually come into Jerusalem and meets with some of the other apostles. He says he placed it before him. He placed the gospel before them. <clears throat> and I don't believe that he placed it before them for them to kind of fact check him. He wanted to make sure that the church in Jerusalem and his ministry were kind of pulling together. That the gospel was moving together. He had 100% confidence in the gospel. And so he comes to the apostles and we can recognized that it had authority because the apostles, when they heard his gospel and when they saw the things, the ministry that he had, says, they added nothing to me. They did not change any of it. When I put the gospel in front of them, they said, this is the same gospel. We're, Peter's been given this gospel to take it to the Jews. You've been given the exact same gospel. We don't have to make adjustments. There's no confusion about what you're preaching, and you're supposed to take that to the Gentiles. And as kind of a living illustration, Paul drug this man Titus, who he'd seen come to the Lord and begun discipling, drug Titus down into Jerusalem with him. Titus is a Greek, not circumcised, not Jewish, kind of as a living illustration, like, hey, I've got a guy right here who's a Greek, who trusted in Christ, and what are you guys going to do about it? And it caused a little, caused a little um, uproar. There were some, some people who were kind of snuck in and seems like they tried to compel Titus to become circumcised and come under the law, but not from the apostles. The apostles, these other men who had Christ given, had given them authority to be his messengers, they were convinced. They said, okay, the gospel you have is from God. And so they gave him the right hand of fellowship. They commissioned him. They said, all right, go on your way. This is God's gospel. And so Paul had been out in the desert. There wasn't anybody tutoring him in the gospel. He received it directly from God, and it carried divine authority. <clears throat> now he turns, the other section, the other part of this story is about himself. His authority had been questioned. His apostleship had been questioned by these, these agitators in the church. And so we remember how he starts his gospel. His apostleship came from God. It wasn't from man, not through men. It wasn't commissioned him by the other apostles. <laughs> As a heightened picture of this, when, when Paul first comes into Jerusalem for a very brief period in time, the apostles are terrified of him. <laughs> They're like, uh, yeah, we don't want to be anywhere near that guy. That was the guy that was trying to catch us all and imprison us all. And now he's coming in and saying, hey, I believe in Jesus. Like, let's meet. And like, no, we don't want to die. Like, we're not stupid enough to not recognize this trap, right? They're, so they are afraid of him. And Barnabas actually kind of vouches for him to the apostles. Hey, this is legit. This guy had an experience with God. His testimony is powerful. He's gone through this whole region. He's been preaching the gospel. God has been working through him. We can accept him. But they were scared. They didn't give him authority. They were, they were scared of what he was going to do. 
The second thing, when Paul comes to them, and we see this in, in, verse, uh, in chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. Then after 14 years, so he's been preaching for 14 years, not just a few months, he's been preaching for 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this is his trip to Jerusalem, with Barnabas, taking Titus with me. I went up because of a revelation, and I set before them the gospel. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. He came, and he wasn't looking. This is an indication of his authority. He came, and he wasn't looking for their stamp of approval. He came as, as, an, as an equal to them. He didn't come in and submit themselves and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. He came in as an equal, as an apostle, and he had confidence. He didn't, he didn't allow Titus to be circumcised. He didn't need their stamp of approval. He just spent 14 years preaching the gospel and seeing what God had done. He came down as a gospel expert apostle with divine authority. And that's how he interacted with the apostles. He didn't lord it over them. He wasn't arrogant about it. He had the same apostleship they did, but he came with confidence. And they gave him the right hand of fellowship like we saw. The very end of this section is a very interesting moment. Uh, this is now Paul's talking about while he's in Antioch. You'll remember that he's already done his first missionary journey. He's planted these churches. The Jerusalem church sent him on his way. They sent him on this journey. He's preached. People have come to faith. The Galatian church is one of them. Or the Galatian region. These churches are some of those who have come to faith. And now he's back in Antioch. And one of the ways that the Christian community was first realized was when Jews began table fellowship, eating with the Gentiles. This was crazy. For a Jew under the law, you would never eat a meal with a Gentile. You would be considered unclean. Any piece of, any piece of uh, silverware or dish they touched would be unclean. You would have to do a lot of different rituals just to get your house back in order if a Gentile came into your home. And Paul has seen, as the gospel goes forth, that these, these Gentile Greeks are, are coming to Christ. These Jews are coming to Christ. And he sees this life together. He is seeing that as both of these parties are submitting to the gospel of Christ, they're submitting to God's authority, that they have this incredible freedom they're experiencing in relationship with one another. They're sitting down across from each other. They're sharing the things in their lives. They're sharing the things that God has done. And they're sharing a meal. And they're doing this regularly. They're meeting in people's homes. Now he's in Antioch. He's traveled this journey. He's seen these miracles, these miraculous things happen. And him and Peter are there and Barnabas is there and some other leaders and the Jews. And so the Gentiles are eating with the Jews and they're having this time of fellowship. And they're sharing the stories of what God has done and they're so encouraged. And then these Jewish leaders come in. These Jewish leaders who did not believe in this God, they believed that the, the Gentiles needed to come back under the law. So these are kind of some big wigs. And they roll into the community. And it seems like they roll into a place where, they come into a place where there's actually supper happening. They're experiencing table fellowship together. And Peter sees them. And out of fear, what they'll say, out of fear for his reputation... Now, we don't know all the reasons, but it just says, out of fear of these men, Peter kind of gets up from the table where he's eating with the Gentiles and goes to where these men are. Who won't, who, and he separates himself from the Gentiles. He separates himself. And Barnabas sees Peter go. And so Barnabas is like, oh, oh, Peter, I'll go too then. And so Barnabas moves away. And some of the other Jews begin to move away from the Gentiles. And Paul sees this, the wedge of the law driving into the Christian community and creating this divisiveness. And so he says, I oppose Peter to his face in front of them all. It wasn't a backroom conversation. Paul sees there's a moment happening right here. And it's, it's important for us to be clear in our mind. It wasn't that Peter actually believed it wasn't that he came under, the, he tried to come back under the law. He was just scared. He was worried about these men, and so he played the fool. It says he acted the hypocrite, and that's kind of like putting a mask on. It's not who you really are. You're just kind of pretending. It's a masquerade. So you kind of have this mask on. You're pretending to be somebody else. And so 
So Peter wasn't true to himself, and he led Barnabas astray, and he leads these other Jews astray. And Paul stands up and, and to his face confronts Peter. He says, if you live like a Gentile, eating with the Gentiles, eating the food of the Gentiles, how are you now going to tell the Gentiles, now that the Jews are here, these leading Jews, how are you going to tell the Gentiles that they have to live like Jews? And we don't know how the rest of the conversation goes. We just see that in, in chapter 2, verse 14. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, that's Peter, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? He says, you don't even do this. You don't, you're living like a Gentile, you're exp- and you're living in freedom. How are you going to bring them? How are you going to force them to come under the law? Now, we know through Acts and the later testimony that Peter, Peter changed his tune. And Peter saw the hypocrisy in his ways and came full circle. He kind of, because Peter... Well, remember this Jerusalem council when they were arguing, they were fighting over who is right. Is it the gospel that Paul's preaching or is it the law? How does one become free? How does one become right with God? Peter's argument is kind of the one that convinces everybody. Now, you can read that in Acts chapter 10, I believe. But we see this is, Paul uses this last story as an illustration as he confronts Peter. Now, Peter wasn't some slough, right? Peter wasn't just some, you know, disciple that had ended up kind of in ministry, right? Peter, Peter was kind of a wild card through the Gospels. Remember Peter, right? Cut someone's ear off, jumps out of a boat, you know, all kinds of different things, betrays Jesus. I mean, he, he's a passionate man. And Christ pulls him aside. And he says, Peter, I'm, gonna, I'm building my church on you. Changed his name to Peter. Which means the rock. Because that's what he was, he said, I'm going to build my church on you. Peter was the, like the pinnacle. He was, I mean, the church is built on the truth of Christ. And Peter was the one that Jesus chose out of the, his three closest friends. Said, Peter, you're the one I'm going to build the church on. So Peter was a big figure in the early church. He was one of the heads of the early church. And here, Paul has no hesitation to stand and accuse him to his face of playing the hypocrite. You have to have some sense of authority to be able to do that. And Paul knew. Paul knew his authority had been given to him by God. And so he uses this story that has happened to say, hey, check with people. Go find out. I stood and opposed Peter to his face. And Peter, when Peter played the hypocrite, when Peter wandered from the truth of the gospel and began to pull these other men with him, I opposed him to his face. My authority was not from Peter. My authority was not from James. It wasn't from John. My authority came directly from God, and that's the authority I work on. So he gives this testimony to highlight, to prove to these people, to these brothers and sisters, that his authority and the gospel's authority was from God. This isn't Paul on a power trip. This was Paul exercising his authority appropriately to protect the gospel even amongst the other apostles. Paul had seen the beauty of people who submit to God's authority in their life and the freedom that that brought. He'd seen it, he'd experienced it, he'd tasted it. And he is so concerned that they're going to come back into slavery under the law, that the gospel itself, the foundation of the gospel will be ripped out and these people will be deceived. He's so concerned, he's seen it happen And so he writes to convince them that remember, remember where this gospel came from. Remember where my authority came from. It's not from man. I'm not trying to please man. My goal is to please God. I'm a servant of Christ. When we we hear this, when we read this, it's direct, direct and powerful application in our own lives. Because as we approach God's word, as we approach the words of Christ, the words of the apostles who had been given this divine authority... That divine authority remains. And so, who's in authority? The question for us is, the question he's, he's charging to the Galatians to think, whose authority are you coming under in your life? Whose authority are you under? And the question is the same for us. Who's in authority for our lives? Who gets to, who gets to make all the decisions? 
Who gets to direct our ways? Who gets to frame the way we think about things? Is it just us? We live in a culture that is very much about how we feel. And that if you feel strongly enough about something, then it's, act, then it's probably right. I mean, and you've seen, I've seen abuses of this all over. There's, te- you know, testimonies of people who, based on their feelings and what they desire and what they want, the desires of the flesh, which we're going to read about later, make terrible decisions. <laughs> we can all look in a mirror and see someone who has, right, at some point. Because of the desires, because, and we think, oh, this is how I feel. Because I feel I'm, I'm real tired or I'm sick or I'm impatient and I just feel like, you know, I'm justified in this. My kid was out of hand, so I was justified in, in really yelling at him and getting him down. You know, and, and as opposed to a godly way of directing and, and figuring out how to discipline and direct your kid. You know, you kind of lash out in anger. I'm justified. I'm the parent. I'm in authority. Maybe how you treat your wife when you're in a conflict. Justified, man. She came at me. Or he, he yelled first, you know. Our feelings, we think our feelings get to be the authority in our life, but what we see so clearly here in Scripture is that God gets to be the authority. And we, as we submit more and more to God, that's the counterintuitive nature of it. We will be more free in our relationships with our children, with our spouses, with our friends, with our neighbors, with our coworkers. We see Paul fighting so desperately for these believers to submit to God's authority in their lives. That's, that's what we are, that's our desire. That's why we do what we do here from Paul and myself, Matt, Kathy, the elders, everybody on staff and everybody in ministry. We, we desire for you all to submit to God's authority and experience the freedom that comes from it. Not the slavery, not the bondage, but the freedom that comes in that, the fruit of that. That faith in the finished work of Christ, by the power of the Spirit, will set us free. It set us free in relationship. We also see Paul's life as a powerful illustration of the authority of the gospel. Paul's life changed from when he just persecuted the church to now where he would give his life for the church is a, is a picture of the power of the gospel. And the authority of the gospel in his life. What's our picture? Now most of us, I'll even probably say none of us will have a conversion experience like Paul's where we actually hated the church. Though we do see, we do see through, you know, Beth Prince highlighting Voice of the Martyrs, we do see people who are devoting their life currently in Islam to shutting down the church, to killing Christians, to persecuting the church. We do see them coming to Christ. But for us... What's our story? Where's our picture where the authority of God's word and the authority of God in our life has changed the way we live? If someone were to see and you were to share, your story is a powerful testimony. And I would encourage you, we're going to have baptisms in between service here in about 15 minutes. Stick around and hear. Hear the markers. Hear the little moments. Some of the moments of where God's children have come in contact with his truth and it's changed their life. Stick around and hear that. And think for yourself, where is it that the gospel has changed my life? It changed the way I work with people. I, I used to take pleasure in manipulating people and circumstances and, and figuring out a way to, to basically rip people off. That was one of the things I struggled with as, as a young man. It was a pattern I learned. And the gospel, I realized pretty quickly that, okay, the gospel, God's word, God's authority in my life is paramount. He's in charge. And this dishonors him. You know, as we submit to God's authority, he frees us, frees us more and more. Not just from the eternal penalty from our sin, but from the current power of, this, of sin in our lives. The more we submit, the more we're set free. Lastly, can you defend the gospel? Would you be able to defend the gospel against those that would bring an accusation? Paul knew the gospel. The gospel has God's authority. It's the power of God into salvation for those who would believe. Could you defend it? Could you articulate it? I hope so. We talked a little bit about that last week. If not, we have some resources out in the foyer, discipleship resources that will help you. There's the case for Christ, a powerful explanation of a man's journey, learning about how to prove that Christ was real, the things he said was real, the resurrection. There's a lot of resources out there. Look at them, the books. Just feel free. Take them. If you're going to read them and you're going to use them, take them. 
you're discipling someone, take some of the resources. If you're being discipled, look at the resources. Now, we have on, on our wall as you leave, you'll see love God, love others, and make disciples. That's what we're about here. And the degree to which we, as, as, as God's people, are submitted to God's authority in our lives directly impacts our willingness and ability to disciple and be discipled. As we submit to God's authority, it blooms in us a genuine life, a life of authenticity. The farther away we get from God's authority, the more wickedness and sin we put into our lives. And then we don't want people to see what's in there. So we're able to dress up nice and get a smile on for Sunday, but Monday through Saturday is a nightmare. And nobody knows. As we submit to God's authority, he begins to bloom in us an authentic life where we want to grow. No one's perfect. As Paul says, we're not perfect, but we want to be progressing, to be moving forward. And so as we submit to God, we're more likely to want to bring someone else in that because we experience the freedom that comes through that submission and we want to say to someone, come with me. This is, this is what discipleship is. Come and experience the same freedom. I'm not perfect. I don't know everything, but come with me. Do life with me. Here's my life. I want to pour it into you. And if we're young in the faith, we're like, oh, man, I'd love to be more free. Interact with someone around you. I mean, come speak with us. Like, find someone that will disciple you. Pray that God would bring someone into your life that's mature and will disciple you. And then be open for when that happens. And you might have to initiate a conversation. That's the system God made. It wasn't people on their own. We interact together. We make disciples and we are disciples. And so the degree to which we surrender dramatically impacts our discipleship. Let's go ahead and close in prayer and then a couple things for you guys. Gracious Father, you are gracious with us and you are patient because we are a long way away from, from what you initially desired. But you love us and you made a way for us to have peace with you and not just have peace with you, but to find freedom in this life. It would true joy in our relationships where they aren't always stressed and strained and manipulating and violent. But we can have freedom. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we'll never have those things, Lord, but we want to be moving in them. Draw us on our knees through humili humility to submit to you. Holy Spirit, speak in the lives of your people to the degree which I'm not submitted, Lord. Draw me in deeper. I know there's areas for I've not submitted. Open my heart up to those, Lord, through the power of your word. Thank you that you gave this authority to your apostles and you put this authority in your word and it has power. It's not like a book. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you that you meet us where we're at and you meet us in our weaknesses and then your power shines through. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. A uh, couple things, uh, like I said, we have baptisms in just a few minutes, so we'd love for you to stick around for that. Also, we want to continue to encourage you, uh, I didn't mention this last week, but we're memorizing together as a family, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, through chapter 6, verse 10. That's Galatians 5, 13, through 6, verse 10. We encourage you to memorize that with us, we're working on it, and I'm uh, moving along, so we encourage you to memorize that with us. And uh, other than that, have a wonderful, have a wonderful week serving the Lord, and God bless you guys. Thanks for joining us this morning.